Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Global Solutions Summit 2019. Please welcome Dennis Noah, President of the Global Solutions Initiative. Dear Professor Rochol, Governing Mayor Michael Müller, Your Excellencies, dear friends and participants, welcome to the Global Solutions Summit. This summit serves as a stepping stone for the Japanese T20 summit and thereon to the Japanese G20 presidency. That is its purpose and we look forward in the coming year to engaging with our Saudi Arabian counterparts to serve them in the same capacity. This is the third summit of Global Solutions, helping the T20 become an intellectual backbone for the G20. Global Solutions Summit gives a voice to researchers around the world to engage them with the challenges of the 21st century. And through the Global Solutions Initiative, this big, vast network of researchers is connected to communities in business, policymakers, NGOs worldwide, because we're cognizant that none of us can deal with the problems that we face on our own. And we are particularly proud to have this summit hosted in the city of Berlin, which, as we've just heard, shows what great prospects can emerge from the confluence of ideas and people and communities when a nation confronts its history and sets out on a path of freedom and social responsibility. The theme of this summit is paradigm change to recouple the world. It's based on a claim the concerning the current world order and a vision of our future. And let me give you my interpretation of the claim. You'll have your own interpretations and diversity of interpretations is what we encourage here. In fact, there will be a good number of paradigm change sessions at this um, summit, um, each with its own perspective. My point of departure here is that the current world order is being called into question and the symptoms of this crisis abound. The growing disillusionment with democracy, growing critique of capitalism, mistrust of all our institutions, governments, political parties, international institutions, corporations, media, NGOs, rising nationalist, populist, religious supremacy movements, a declining political will to solve global problems multilaterally, acts of racist, nationalist, ethnic, religious violence, such as the Christchurch massacre. And as a result of these crises, our transnational problems are proliferating. We are making tragically little progress in combating climate change, protectionist pressures, cybersecurity threats, humanitarian nightmares, refugee crises, and much more. The claim, under my interpretation, that underlies the summit theme is that all these crises arise from the decoupling of the major domains of human affairs. The prevailing economic domain that's governed largely by globalization, market-driven globalization, has integrated the world economy and generated a huge amount of wealth. But the prevailing political and social domains are increasingly driven by nationalism, religion, ethnicity. They remain fragmented, keeping our allegiances fragmented as well. Aggregate income keeps growing while the social prosperity of many people stagnates amid rising inequality and social conflict. Nations of the world are mismanaging our global commons 
with disastrous consequences, possibly, for future generations. In short, our economic, political, and environmental and social progress has become decoupled from one another. The world need not be this way. And we, I believe, see a different world in the future where things can be managed differently. And this diagnosis harbors also a vision of a flourishing future, an achievable future, in which our economic, political, social, environmental domains become recoupled, recoupled with thriving people in thriving communities. This is achievable, and the work of the T20 Japan under the inspired leadership of Dean Yoshino, the Dean of ADBI, Yoshino-san, um, speaks to this vision in terms of what Prime Minister Abe has called free, open, inclusive, and sustainable society. It's addressed through T20 recommendations to promote quality infrastructure and investment opportunities in development, um, con developing countries, universal health care, needs of aging societies, marshalling technological advances to foster human-centered post-industrial 4.0 society, reform of international governance structures to promote free trade, climate action, and much more. Recommendations are being generated by the Japanese T20 process, flowing into the Japanese G20, and our job here is to give them voice. So today, recoupling is a dream, but tomorrow it can be a reality. Because throughout history, we have risen to challenges of this sort. Our thriving societies have always rested on social allegiances at scales relevant to the challenges that we faced. So when the challenges were local, we addressed them by forming local allegiances. And when the challenges grew in scale, then so did our acts of cooperation. And in the process, humanity has dreamt ever more ambitious dreams. Dreams of making humanity literate. Dreams of abolishing slavery. Dreams of creating sovereign nation states, dreams of establishing democracy, and we largely have turned these dreams into reality. And how did we perform these miracles? We performed these miracles through something that no other animal has mastered. Moral narratives supported by institutions of multi-level governance. Moral narratives supported by institutions of multi-level governance. The moral narratives created identities of social groups requisite to the challenges that we face. The narratives managed to extend our cooperative units from the family to the tribe, to the village, to cities, to empires, nations, and so forth. And through these narratives, we gained multiple identities. Identities at various levels. The level of the family, level of friendships, occupations, nations, ethnicities, religions, and so forth. And within each of these groups, we built an interchangeability of perspectives seeing the world through the same eyes. We build webs of reciprocal obligations, often accompanied by empathy and compassion. We turned me-them relationships into me-us relationships. And the me-us relationships generated virtuous cycles of values, such as care and reciprocal fairness and authority and loyalty in a responsible sense. The integration of the global economy and the global environment nowadays calls for moral narratives 
that induce us to cooperate on transnational, often global scales. But at the same time, we must maintain our sense of belonging at small, smaller scales, local, na and those scales relevant to our local and national challenges. And in order for societies to flourish, our identities at these different scales must be in harmony with one another. For example, there can't be an any conflict between our identity at the national level and at transnational level. So to address global challenges, our us-them relationships need to be turned into us-us relationships. Politicians have to avoid defining national identity in opposition to nations from whom they require transnational cooperation. It makes no sense. Scapegoating transnational institutions, such as the European Union or the World Trade Organization, hurts this cause. It leads to conflict among identities that we need to tackle the multi-level problems at multi-level scales. And of course, the same challenge applies to the transnational institutions themselves. They must be respectful of the national narratives, allowing nations the liberty to address their national problems independently. And observing the principle of subsidiarity can help transnational organizations address these um, issues at the relevant scale. And such crafting of mutually respectful narratives across relevant scales has recurred repeatedly through history. Our challenge is simply to increase the scale now. But moral narratives alone are not sufficient. In the past, whenever we've been successful at extending our domains of cooperation, we have done so through institutions of multi-level governance, promoting cooperation at the scales where our challenges lie. And what is striking is that these multi-level narratives, supported by multi-level governance structures, mirror the multi-level selection that is becoming increasingly recognized in biological and cultural evolution. Multi-level selection theory recognizes that in the process of evolution, selection occurs, acts not only on individuals, but also uh, on groups at multiple levels. Groups containing a higher proportion of cooperating individuals may gain a competitive advantage over groups of selfish individuals. Social norms and institutions of, uh, of governance can serve to reduce individual level variation and competition, thereby shifting selection to a group level. Now, the crucial difference between this cultural evolution and biological evolution is that the ideas, norms, and values that underlie cultural evolution can be managed. And that enables us to adopt a mission of shaping our domains to recouple the world. It is in our hands. And this mission has a number of important implications. In the political domain, our political allegiances need to be recoupled with the actual challenges we face out there as human beings. Where the challenges cross multiple national borders, such as in the case of climate change, financial crises, cybersecurity, the only way forward is through multilateral cooperation. Of course, such multilateral cooperation requires acceptance of responsibility that the gains from such cooperation be felt at every national level. But for such global challenges, all the countries of the world are in the same boat. And when a boat has a leak, all crew members had better cooperate to solve the problem, otherwise they all drown. 
So therefore, multilateralism in this sense is a support, not an obstacle to nationalism. The G20 should turn this simple truth into a global social norm. The G20 has special power for promoting global social norms. This is one of them. Nationalism that opposes multilateralism in these global domains is self-defeating. In medicine, the pursuit of selfish goals in a context that requires cooperation, such as cells proliferating within a body, is called cancer. This analogy is useful to keep in mind because the basic underlying principle in the G20 context is the same. In the social domain, we must achieve harmony among our multiple allegiances, enabling us to tackle our challenges at the scales where they arrive. And therefore, there can be no, in this context, conflict between patriotism and cosmopolitanism. Regarding transnational challenges, politicians have the obligation to promote the cosmopolitanism of their citizens, because thereby these politicians gain the popular mandate to enter into the multilateral agreements that promote national goals. And this, too, is a simple truth that the G20 should turn into a global social norm. And in the economic domain, the implication is that globalization should not be pursued at the expense of local communities. The new paradigm should encourage and build strong local identities, enabling us all to reap the gains from globalization. It implies that neither top-down central planning nor bottom-up laissez-faire is the appropriate response to globalization. Instead, we need mutually sustaining policies at macro, meso, micro levels. Cities, governments, local communities moving in the same direction because their vision is aligned through a common moral narrative. But the most important aspect of this paradigm change, I believe, is one that will have to take place in our heads. And that's where the difficult work begins. It means changing our way of thinking about how we relate to others in the world. And in particular, I believe it means avoiding three misleading ideas, all of which, as it turns out, are supported by conventional economic analysis, but we'll tiptoe past that one. The first misleading idea is materialism, that human well-being depends only on goods and services consumed. Human beings do not live by bread alone. Beyond material things, our well-being also depends on empowerment, our ability to shape our fate through our own efforts. And it also depends on solidarity, our giving of um, belonging and care to others and receiving it ourselves. In the opening decades after the Second World War, Westerners felt strongly empowered uh, through post-war re uh, reconstruction, Germany is a really good example, and socially connected through common wartime experience. And there, it was useful to focus primarily on generating material wealth. But when globalization and automation threaten empowerment through worldwide reallocations of work and threaten social solidarity by undermining traditional manufacturing communities, then exclusive policy focus on goods and services becomes problematic. 
Under these circumstances, the success of economic policy should be measured by more than GDP. National, regional, local authorities should articulate their goals not only in terms of material prosperity, but also for empowerment and social solidarity. Measure their performance accordingly, design policies explicitly to achieve these goals. And similarly, the success of business should not be measured by just shareholder value. Company law needs to be reformed, requiring corporations to articulate their social purposes, mandate delivery on these purposes, measure performance, and provide incentives to, uh, to accordingly. Creating this new paradigm requires systemic change, involving a change of our laws and institutions, our norms and values for all relevant stakeholders. And the G20 is a good place for this to come together. The second misleading idea is the social value of self-interest. This is the idea that underlies the principle of the invisible hand, whereby the pursuit of selfish interests and free markets leads people to promote the interests of society as a whole. I mean, the formal economic analysis of the invisible hand has been interpreted uh, in terms of a mathematical justification of greed is good. This analysis assumes that people's preferences are independent of one another. And they receive full monetary compensation for everything that they do. This theory is not unequivocally wrong. It just ignores the role of social groups in creating the trust, the goodwill, <coughs> the friendship. Thank you. I'm taking note. Um, that is required um, for uh, this uh, invisible hand to work. And therefore, we should build on these social capacities. The third misleading idea is that we have either centralized or decentralized decision making that governs our processes. And that too is misleading because the big divide between left and right wing policies is basically concerned with whether centralized or decentralized decision making generates progress. And it blinds us to new political fault lines between open and closed societies. That's a line drawn on the basis of social solidarity. Um, a fault line between a protecting welfare state and an enabling welfare state, an empowering one. Um, that's a fault line that depends on empowerment. Um, these are the big challenges that we face in the future, and uh, we need to keep our eyes open to them. And that requires people cooperating at various scales. That, in sum, is my interpretation of paradigm change to recouple the world. To summarize, though we have common global problems, we live in diverse societies and polities from which we derive our diverse identities. Human diversity is an enduring fact of life, and globalization cannot and should not erase it. But this diversity need not drive us apart. We have a choice between the type of diversity that we live under, a conflictual diversity where we haggle over alleged zero-sum spoils, or a cooperative diversity in which we recognize the value of different social belongings and mutually nourishing ecosystems of humanity. Within the G20, we can manifest our diversity in dealing with our local challenges and at the same time share responsibility to sustain a planet that sustains us all. Diversity of thinking is a source of innovation and progress, and diversity of norms and values provides a huge storehouse of insights on new ways to promote cooperation 
towards global goals. And the work of the Japanese T20 is a microcosm of this process. It exhibits the creativity that flows when diverse communities come together in respect and nurturing. I wish the best of good fortune to the Japanese T20, and I look forward to joining you in recoupling the world.